All right, all right, all right. Dr. Pines at the Premier Productivity Expert, and today I'm bringing you three things Aladdin, the movie Aladdin, can teach us about getting into medical school. Yes, I said that correctly. That cartoon movie, you can actually learn from it. <laughs> this is part of my series of Disney gets you to medical school, Disney gets you success. Check out the channel, check out the uh, playlist with all my Disney movie references. It's amazing. So, three things Aladdin can teach us about medical school. Number one, right, the first thing you can learn from Aladdin is that you can go from street rat to prince with a little help from the MCAT genie. If you spent four years goofing around or you worked hard but couldn't get the right strategies together to get those A's, then you might be forced to rummage through the medical school garbage for admission scraps. Many students think that taking more classes is the key to getting off the streets and into the palace. Wrong, guys. GPA stands for grade point average. The key word there being average, right? It's a cumulative average. So if it took you four years to create your current terrible GPA, it's not going to improve overnight after a few classes. You're going to be better off spending your time and effort on studying for the MCAT. Rub the heck out of that MCAT prep lamp, guys, and hope that magical 90th percentile MCAT pops out to grant you all your med school wishes. Admissions committees evaluate you on multiple criteria, one of which is your academic aptitude. This consists of your GPA and your MCAT score. As such, one can compensate for the other. To a point, that is, right? So I say if you have a bad GPA, don't take more classes. But what I mean is if you're a fringe candidate, then there's no point in taking more classes necessarily. For example, if your GPA is a 2.1, Right? That's way too low. The greatest MCAT score in the world won't be able to get you into medical school to 2.1. But at the same time, I see a lot of students who are 3.0 GPAs, right? And they're like, oh, you know, my GPA is too long. I'm going to spend two years doing a post back. You don't necessarily have to do that because you're right on the cusp. Take the time, blow out the MCAT, and get that amazing MCAT score, and that will make that 3.0 GPA look so much better and make you competitive. So do you guys see the difference there between a super low GPA and a borderline GPA? That MCAT can put you right over the top. So this brings me to a couple exceptions that I want to talk about. These are the times when you should actually take more classes. When your GPA is borderline and a few more classes could put you over a certain threshold. For example, if you have a 2.9 GPA, I would take the time and get that brought up to a 3.0 because that brings you over certain schools cutoffs. And these cutoffs aren't necessarily concrete, but certain schools just had to pick a number. And why not pick a square number like 3.0 or 3.5? So if you're right on the cusp like with a 2.9 GPA or you have a 3.4 GPA, take a couple more classes and get just over that hump, and that'll put you in the running for a couple more schools. The second exception is when you have multiple Ds and Fs on your transcripts. If you have multiple Ds and Fs, that's going to be a really big red flag for medical schools. You don't want to get red flagged. <laughs> so take the time, retake those classes, and I know it's a pain in the butt sometimes, and I know we don't want to spend the extra time it takes to really get our application together, but just spending a little bit of time in the end, I promise you guys, is going to save you a ton of stress and time on the back end. So take some time, retake those classes. It will improve your GPA and also, in a, as a whole, make your transcript look more appealing. While we're talking about retakes, it's important to note that they recently changed the structure of how grades are credited at DO schools. And this is throwing a lot of students for loops because they're assuming that, oh, you know what, my GPA is bad for medical school, but DO schools allow you to completely replace grades when you retake a course. Well, DO schools have actually changed that recently in late 2016, early 2017. They changed it so that they actually now are looking at grades the same way medical schools are. And so it's tough. So remember that. But anyway. Uh, the third exception to when you should actually take more classes and when, is when you have a really low GPA like I talked about, right, that 2.1. In that case, you need to do a post-bac. And the post-bac is different from taking courses at a community college or back at your school because a post-bac is kind of a certified program where the school has run this curriculum by medical schools and, know, and medical schools know that this is a rigorous program packed with other people trying to get to medical school. So if you can do well in a post-bac program, it almost serves as like a pseudo replacement for your undergrad grade. So it can do a lot more repairing than just the raw to raw class to class comparison. So that's all tip number one, right? So realize that you can go from street rat to prince with just a little help from the MCAT genie, depending on what your GPA is. The second thing you can learn from Aladdin 
is you don't want to entrust your medical school future to a Jafar, <laughs> right? You don't have a young boy, his monkey best friend, and a powerful genie to save you from a malicious advisor like the Sultan did. So protect yourself, guys. You're not that Sultan guy. This is not a cartoon. This is your real life. The wrong advisor could be intentionally or more commonly unintentionally leading you to your doom. Here are a couple tips on finding mentors and advisors. Make sure your advisor has the appropriate experience. If they haven't been a pre-med, they haven't applied to medical school, or haven't been involved in the admissions process, then how can they guide you to be a successful applicant? And I see this all the time where people will sign up with these generic admissions counselors who don't necessarily specifically do medical school or health-related admissions. They do college admissions. Medical school application is entirely different. So why would you entrust yourself to someone who's a broad expert and not a specific expert in the area you need? The second thing is make sure they have enough self-confidence to admit they don't know something. This is one of the major reasons mentors fail is that they might be an amazing person, a great person, and know a lot and be very, very smart. But if they're afraid to look uninformed in any kind of way, they're, they're useless to you, right? I don't know about you, but I don't want to have my future riding on someone's guess. I'd rather have someone who's willing to tell me if something fell out of their scope of advice that I should go find someone else. So when you're given advice, you need to be able to evaluate that advice critically. And if someone is being really vague or is unable to answer clarifying follow-up questions, then you might want to look elsewhere. And this is something that I think has made me very successful as a mentor and as an advisor is that I know a lot, guys. I know a lot more than a lot of advisors out there, but I know when I don't know everything and when I need additional support. And as an example of this, I recently, I have a couple PA students and nursing students that I work with, and one of the PA students asked me a question that, or is aspiring, a pre-PA student, right? And so she asked me a question that I honestly didn't have the answer for. I know a lot about the PA process. I was like, you know, I don't know that answer. And so what I did was <laughs> I sent an email to a, a colleague of mine who's actually does phys physician and uh, assistant school uh, admissions. And so I sent him an email and said, hey, listen, you know what? Uh, I'm doing some advising for PA school and I had this really specific question and I didn't quite know the answer. And so he actually sent me back a really nice response and then I was able to hand that over to the student. And so I could have given her some half-baked vague answer, but instead I went and got a real true answer for her. And that makes all the difference in getting people over the hump and into the school they wanna get into. So look for people who are not afraid to say, listen, I don't know that, but let me try to help you find someone who does. The next thing you should think about in finding mentors and advisors is the most important thing you can do to protect yourself is to have more than one advisor. Having several mentors allows you to have more people to bounce advice off of. For example, in research, a bigger sample size increases the odds of getting an accurate answer, right? It increases the power of your study. It's the same way with your mentors and advisors. Whenever people work with me, I always tell them, I should never be your only advisor. You should have 10, 15, 20 people who are all experts in particular areas that can really help you and also help validate and verify what other advisors and mentors are telling you, right? Again, that sounding board to make sure you're getting the best advice possible. Now, as a continuation of that, you're getting all these mentors and advisors, so who should be your advisors? How many do you need? Well, if you have a group of advisors, have advisors that have different areas of expertise. It doesn't do any good to have everyone know the medical school admissions process. Get one, two, three people that know the medical school admissions process. Then get another handful of people who know about extracurriculars, another handful of people who know about whatever it might be, right? Who can help you in your personal life, whatever. So one may be a researcher, one may be an admissions expert, on down the line, but always, right, the most important person to have is one who is a master of life. And what do I mean by that? That's someone who can go, right, you can go to with your personal issues and they won't judge you. So this is someone who doesn't necessarily you're not going to get a letter of recommendation from. It's not someone who's going to be more of a professional ally for you, but it's a personal ally. So it's someone, when you're in crisis mode, you can go to and tell them just how bad you messed up. And they won't judge you. They'll help you get somewhere, right? They'll help you with some sound words of wisdom and help you get your life back on track. All right, that is two of the three things we can learn from Aladdin, guys. If this is your first time coming in contact with me, I want you to know that I'm Dr. Andre Pintet. I am the pre-med productivity expert, and I help all students become more productive in their life so that way they can have their academic dreams come true. That's what I do for students. I have a various areas of focus. I want you to check out my website, premedproductivity.com, and really dive in, guys. I've got courses on there. I've got coaching on there. I can help you be great. So check that out, premedproductivity.com. 
As always, if you want to email me, my email is andre at premedproductivity.com. I do answer questions from students. So let's get to this last third final tip. Phenomenal cosmic power, itty bitty living space. Who remembers that line, right? When the genie's talking about, it's amazing to be this genie, this leader, but I'm cramped in this tiny, 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 tiny lamp. And at the end of the movie, they trick Jafar into being a genie so they can put him back in this tiny lamp. Well, sometimes you sign up for leadership positions that are just like that, right? So my third piece of advice is something you can learn from Aladdin is don't get tricked into a role that is actually a hidden prison. What do I mean by this? Well, all leadership roles, right, when you become the president of a club, they're not the right role necessarily for you. Sometimes you feel honored to be elected or recommended for something. You think it's going to be this great opportunity of a lifetime because you can inspire so much positive change. You do so many amazing things. Then you get the job, and it's like pulling teeth to get anyone to do anything. You end up stressed and stretched thin with nothing to show for it other than plummeting grades and some gray hairs. And I know all about the gray hairs, guys. If you've seen me, you know my, my gray beard is in full effect, guys. <laughs> so learn from my mistakes of taking these positions. You need to make sure that you're prioritizing what you do with your time, and that position may not be the best use of your time. So before you take a leadership position, I want you to take time, seriously. Assess whether it's really all it's cracked up to be. Ask the outgoing leader what their experiences were when they were doing it. What was it like, right? Does that person look beat down and haggard? If they do, run for the hills, guys. Get away from that position. If you do just a little bit of your due diligence and happen to end up in one of these awful positions, right? So you do your due diligence. You think everything's okay. Okay, this is above board. I'm going to have this great thing, right? But every year, right, the, the board of club turns over. So maybe the board the year before was very supportive, and now this year's board is not supportive, and you're doing everything. It's okay to get out and get out before it ruins your life. I don't want you to worry about hurting other people's feelings or seeming like a flake because in the end, they don't help you get into medical school. They're not on the admissions committee. But if you are messing around with them, worried about their feelings, and you get straight Fs, then you will be out of medical school. So focus on that. It's in everyone's best interest, even in theirs, to have you quit. Because then the organization can get a new leader who has the time, the patience, and temperament to run this club with the awful board. Your GPA insanity will remain intact and you'll be freed up to pursue a situation that fits. So it's a win-win-win, guys. They get someone who actually wants to do all this babysitting so they have a better club. You get free and you get your GPA and then in the end, a medical school gets a great candidate like yourself. Win-win-win, that's what you want it to be. So that's three things you can learn from the movie Aladdin. Like I said, check out the rest of my Disney series and what you can learn from Disney movies to get you into medical school. As always, have a great day, a great evening whenever you're listening to this. And like I said, I'm Dr. Andre Pinesett. I'm the premier productivity expert. Check out my website, premierproductivity.com. I do live events around the country, so check out my events calendar. Come out and see me speak live. I'm Dr. Andre Pinesett, and I'm out.